we'll proceed with the first panel uh, on the religion clauses and government neutrality. The moderator is the recently confirmed judge, John Noonan of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, he is still, as he tells me, I was about to say the former professor, uh, the Milo Reese Robbins Professor of Law and Legal Ethics at Bolt Hall, or as we say, Cal. And he will introduce the other panelists. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to welcome you all who've gotten up early for the, this panel, this important topic. You will recall that Samuel Johnson once commented that the loudest cries for liberty came from those Americans whom he succinctly described as Yankee slave drivers. Somehow, we in this society instinctively see ourselves as the moral heirs of Johnson, ready to puncture the hypocrisy of those claiming a monopoly of moral virtue, while in fact sinning most obviously in respect to the very virtue that they claim to possess. Self-satisfaction, we feel, goes along with self-deception in the case of our enemy. The enemy is formally mealy-mouthed, canting, empty-headed liberalism, <laughs> masking a preference for government-imposed solutions, indeed masking a pure statism and the will to power. And if the enemy is occasionally ourselves, religion is a subject which invites self-analysis. If there is any topic on which self-satisfaction prevails, accompanied and indeed made possible by the most generous doses of self-deception, it is the alleged neutrality of government about religion. We have a panel well calculated to penetrate the myths. Michael McConnell is professor of law at a university now famous for recruiting brilliant talent from other universities. <laughs> and he has been recruited from a justice department famous itself for recruiting brilliant talent. I doubt if there has been such brilliance in the Justice Department since the heyday of the New Deal. And the reason is the same. The law is being set in a new direction. Creative talent is necessary to do it. Professor McConnell has been a creative contributor to that process. Arthur Spitzer comes to us from the ACLU. He replaces Morton Halperin on the program. I have been on panels arranged by liberals often enough to appreciate the exquisite liberal sense of equality and fairness. Typically, it has been three of them and one of us. <laughs> Knowing the merits of the cause, I've thought, that's right. That makes it a fair and equal contest. <laughs> Today, when the ratio is reversed, I am not so sure of our society's sense of justice. 
I am, however, sure that at least the society believes in free speech. And Mr. Spitzer will have, if not equal access to your time, at least some time sharing. <laughs> he is the Washington legal director of the ACLU. We will reverse the order to the extent of permitting him to go third instead of second. Uh, admirable liberal fairness. Uh, Henry Holzer, professor of law at Brooklyn Law School, has battled the ACLU in a close celeb preventing the return of young Walter Polachek to Moscow. A return sought by his Russian parents and by that great defender of the rights of the family, the ACLU. <laughs> the battle gave Professor Holzer the experience to know that the most respectable slogans can be put to the most coercive uses. He had admirably equipped him to inspect the shibboleths that are brandished by litigants in the area of church and state. He confronted an Orwellian inversion of liberty and won. Today he speaks on another subject where Orwellian inversions are common and where common sense must penetrate the subterfuges. And finally, there is with us this morning Robert Cord, professor of political science and distinguished university professor at Northeastern University. The author of a famous book, The Separation of Church and State, a path-breaking book on the history of the First Amendment. For a great many law students and other Americans, history in church and state affairs begins sometime in the 1940s, when the first Supreme Court first applied the First Amendment religion clauses to the states. Professor Cord knows that the history began about 160 years earlier. He has rescued that history from the defaced corruption in which partisan litigants had presented it to the court and in which the court had presented it to the country. Professor Cord knows the original intent of the framers can be ascertained, and he has ascertained it. Professor McConnell. Thank you very much. I'm honored to be a, a part of this panel. I've, I've noticed, I don't know if anyone else has, that there's something of a pattern to these panels at this event. First of all, there's the University of Chicago law professor. Uh, and then there is the, uh, the representative of the other side, one on each panel. And then uh, a third component of each panel is, is a very probable prospective appointment to the United States Supreme Court. Uh, I'm not entirely sure uh, who on this panel qualifies under the third category. I know, I, uh, I, know, I know where I stand, and I suspect I know where Mr. Spitzer stands, but the, uh, if uh, any of the other three of you would like to be introduced to Rocky Reese after the panel, I would be happy to do that. Uh, much of the contemporary debate over the religion clauses of the First Amendment consists of a manipulation of certain very powerful and resonant symbols. The idea of the separation of church and state, the idea of religious liberty, the idea of neutrality. We hear these symbols used, however, in very different ways and toward very different results uh, when used by quite different people. Take the example of the separation of church and state. Now, after the Supreme Court handed down a series of quite egregious decisions last term uh, against individual choice in education, against opportunities for silent religious ex exercise in the public schools, against religious liberty in the workplace. We read in the press after each one of these that the separation of church and state had been restored, giving one the impression that perhaps the separation of church and state is antithetical to the idea of religious liberty or neutrality. But I don't think that that's entirely true because I 
I found myself quite recently invoking the same symbol of the separation of church and state and trying to explain to people in my own uh, community in Chicago why it is that the usual discretionary and arbitrary system of building use permits cannot be applied to a church which is trying to uh, move into a new neighborhood. That is to say that the separation of church and state means that uh, standard listed discretion to decide what churches are in what particular areas uh, is, uh, uh, is, is contrary to the separation of church and state because that's none of the government's business. That, it seems to me, is a use of the idea of separation of church and state, which is, uh, which is promotive of uh, religious liberty as well. Then there's the example of President Reagan, who during the uh, campaign in 1984 went from the Dallas prayer breakfast where he was uh, advocating the uh, constitutional amendment uh, permitting uh, spoken prayer in the public schools. And then he went to, very, within the next week, to one of the major Jewish organizations in which he, too, invoked the symbol of the wall of separation between church and state. It seems to me that there's a problem of language here. The, uh, the age-old adage of you can't, uh, you can't tell the players without a scorecard, therefore, leads me to try to uh, outline certain basic views that you see running through the controversy so as to try to sort out some of these symbols and their uses uh, in, the, uh, in the actual controversies that we see before us because we cannot simply rely upon the words that people use to tell us what meanings they intend. Just a, a caveat, although I have separated the various separationists into six different categories, you may find yourself puzzled by this that Perhaps uh, you fit into largely uh, category two, but you're also uh, moved somewhat by categories four and five or whatever. This is very typical because although I think that there are certain uh, consistent threads that run through the area, there are very few people or organizations, I think, that actually behave consistently in the area of religious liberty. Nonetheless, I think it is useful to try to sort out what the logical positions might be. The first is what I would call the no-aid view. This is the view, and it's usually expressed with a quotation from Justice Black, that no tax of any amount can be used to support a church uh, in, in any way. And it's usually uh, extended to mean that no government benefits can be provided to religious organizations uh, under any circumstances. The no-aid view is animated by uh, an understanding of public life under which the state must be secular. Religion, to the extent that religion uh, will, will continue to exist, must, and, and here I'm going to, quoting from the recent Grand Rapids decision of the Supreme Court, which in turn quoted from that font of unwisdom, uh, the, the decision of in Lemon versus Kurtzman, religion must be a private matter for the individual, the family, and the institutions of private choice. In other words, religion is okay so long it is, as it is kept irrelevant to public life. This has led to what Professor uh, Newhouse has described in his book as the naked public square, the public square that is stripped of the symbols and, and meanings uh, that come from the religious views of the people. Now, I, I mentioned that there's six views, and I think that there's much to be said for all of them, but I think that there's very little to be said for this first one. Uh, the, the contortions that one has to go through in order to arrive at the no-aid view, I think, are, are enormous. Uh, for example, if the question is whether children who choose to go to religious schools can share on equal terms with others in public benefits, such as textbooks, transportation, or remedial education, then the no-aid folks are for separation of church and state. They would deny the aid. But if the question is whether the tentacles of the regulatory state should intrude into the precincts of the church, then they're against separation of church and state because, after all, uh, the separation in that instance would be a, a benefit to the religious organization. Now, the key case here, I think, or a key exemplary case is, is NLRB versus Catholic Bishop of Chicago, which involved the question whether schools, which uh, Catholic parochial schools, which cannot receive government aid because of the theory that the administration of the aid would so entangle 
the government with the schools that it would violate the principle of separation of church and state. The question in this case was whether such schools could be regulated by the, government, by the NLRB under the labor laws of the United States. The entanglement, the, administ the uh, administrative relationship created between the government and the schools is virtually identical whether it is as a matter of benefits or as a matter of, of burdens, that is, of regulation. And I think it is quite astounding that three justices of the Supreme Court, all of them still sitting, took the view that while benefits to the church, to, the, to religious uh, schools, uh, should be denied because of entanglements, nonetheless, regulation of the, st of the religious schools should be permitted despite precisely the same kind of, uh, of entanglement. It seems to me that this is not loyal to any coherent view of separation of church and state, neutrality, or liberty. Uh, this no-aid view, I think, can best be understood by contrasting it to what I would call the genuine separationists. Uh, these are, are the people who believe very strongly in separating the uh, church and state, whether or not it benefits religious organizations. A key case here to look at is Walls versus Tax Commission, which helped upheld the constitutionality of exempting church organizations from, uh, from property taxes. The theory here is that if the government shouldn't be giving money to the churches, nor should the churches be required to give money to the government. Uh, and to be sure, separation of church and state in this sense may sometimes benefit uh, the church, and it may give the church ben uh, advantages over uh, similar uh, uh, forms of, of institution. But it'll be balanced off by the fact that the church will be disadvantaged in other sense senses by, by separation. The, the theory simply is applied on an, on an even-handed basis. Um, a key case to watch in the current term of the Supreme Court to test which of these views of separation, the no-aid, one-sided separation, or the genuine separation view, is the Dayton Christian Schools case, where you have a fundamentalist uh, Christian school in Ohio uh, that has uh, discharged one of its teachers, an employee, and the government has decided that because of the discrimination laws that it should interpose itself between the church and the church's agent, that the, uh, despite the fact that the church has taken the position that the agent has, has gone outside of what it calls the biblical chain of command for uh, resolving uh, differences between the church hierarchy and the, uh, and the servants of the church. If the court is committed to a genuine separationism and not just to a no-aid view, I think we would expect a decision there in favor of the schools. I'm, of course, making no bets. Uh, a third view uh, is the view of strict neutrality. And these, here we move away from, some, from principal emphasis upon these symbols of secularism or separation and think principally about neutrality. Uh, the, this view is, is best expressed by uh, Professor Philip Curland of the University of Chicago Law School. I, I hate to keep uh, rubbing that in. Um, and he explains that the two clauses of the uh, religion clauses of the First Amendment, when read together, mean the simple principle that religion cannot be used as a system of classification either for benefits or for burdens. And so if you believed with the strict, strict neutrality uh, folks and with, with Professor Curlin, then you would say that a school should not be denied aid because it's religious. It ought to have just as much right to government aid as, as a secular school. But you would also say that the school ought to be subject to regulation, just as a secular school would. And you would also say that um, much of the free exercise jurisprudence of the court is wrong when the court has held that, that because of religious, uh, religiously based uh, uh, conscientious decisions that, that some persons are entitled to different treatment from the government than others. For example, Wisconsin versus Yoder, where uh, Amish parents were relieved of the uh, responsibility of sending their children to, the, to uh, schooling after the age of 16. I won't dwell on this very much because outside of Professor Curlin, I've never met anyone who really believes in strict neutrality. Certainly no justice of the Supreme Court has ever come anywhere close. It's, a, it's an interesting academic view, but I don't think has any constituency out in the, in the rough and tumble of, of the cases. Um, moving on to the fourth category, uh, which I would call the pluralists. Here, the pluralists also move away from the idea of separation and even from the idea 
of principal reliance upon neutrality, they place their greatest emphasis upon choice and in the public arena upon, upon diversity. Uh, and it doesn't concern them that the government or the public life may have religious symbols, may have people acting for religious reasons, there may be religious motivations going on because uh, they believe that the public life ought to reflect the people rather than being different from the religious mix of the people. Their principal concern is that the government not throw its weight one way or another to affect the pre-existing um, mix of religious views. Uh, there's no reason for public life to be secular because after all, public, uh, in a democracy uh, in which many people hold religious views, uh, those views ought, ought to be reflected in public life. The uh, key case uh, here uh, to watch is Bender versus Williamsport Area School District, which involves high school students uh, who want to meet during an extracurricular time set up by their school. Now the school allows the students to meet for whatever purposes that they want, but when a group of students decided to meet for prayer and Bible reading and religious discussion, that was too much. That could not be allowed, and they were, and they were told that that would violate the principle of separation of church and state. Now to the pluralist, this decision makes no sense at all, because no one's being required to, engage, to, to join this group, and it is uh, it is governments throwing its weight against religion to try to keep religion uh, as being the single uh, subject that is not permitted for discussion in a, in a public place such as a public school. And so Bender is a key case to watch there. Um, the fifth group that uh, I would uh, describe are the non-preferentialists. Uh, these are very similar to the pluralists and on most issues I identical. The, the, key understanding of the non-preferentialists is that the meaning of the religion clauses is that government may not favor one religion over another. Uh, the most prominent academic spokesman for this view is Professor Cord on, on my left, and I will leave to him uh, explanation of the bases for this view. But just to distinguish it uh, from the pluralists and say why I believe that those are two separate categories, the, the pluralists place a great deal of more emphasis upon the right of non-believers as well as of, of various religions. So that the pluralist does not believe that the government ought to, uh, ought to favor all religions over non-religion. A, a hypothetical example of where this might be important would be uh, a law which granted tuition tax credits to go to a religious private school but not to a non-religious uh, private school. As I understand it, perhaps Mr. Uh, Professor Cord uh, would correct me on this, the non-preferentialist view would say that that's okay, but the pluralist would say no, that, a, uh, uh, that the non-believer is entitled to, uh, to his place in the uh, pluralistic uh, world of religious beliefs as well. The, the key case for the non-preferentialists, -prefer I believe, is Zorak against Clausen back in the early 50s decision by Justice Douglas, which involved a release time program where in the various uh, churches uh, that chose to, chose to participate in the program set up religious education and children were permitted to leave uh, their public school classes and go to the churches and receive the education. The other children uh, remained in the school and study hall. The idea here is that uh, there, was, uh, perf there was no uh, coercion whatsoever, but the various churches were able to, uh, 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 to educate the people that chose to come. However, it was a benefit to all the various religions and not in any way to, uh, to non-religion as well, making it a, a, a very important case and one which has not been followed since by the Supreme Court. The last category I would call the latitudinarians. These are the people who find it difficult to find a violation of the religion clauses in, in anything. Uh, Justice White is the most prominent uh, exponent of this view. Uh, he's really quite consistent. Justice White uh, dissented when the religious institutions were regulated in the same way as all other institutions. In Catholic Bishop of Chicago, he said that there's no reason why parochial schools shouldn't be subject to the labor laws like everybody else. Um, he also dissented when the, uh, when the rest of the court said that parochial schools should be denied benefits because they were, or they were religious. 
Uh, but then he also dissented, and he was the only one when in Widmar versus Vincent, religious groups were, be, were the only uh, groups on college campuses that were not allowed to meet. Basically, it doesn't seem to matter whether you treat them differently as a burden, treat them differently as a benefit, or treat them, uh, uh, or, or treat them the same. Uh, any such relationship between government and the church is okay by Justice White. Uh, each of these uh, strains of thought, uh, I, I, again, I think with the exception of the first, uh, has its appeal in particular uh, cases, and that's why I've, I've cited what I think are the strongest cases for each one. Uh, and it would be interesting, I think, as we see three other quite different views uh, to, to try to, to, to see how uh, any given set of opinions on the questions fits into, these, into this taxonomy of, of trying to separate out uh, the various forms of separationists. Thank you. I find it easier to talk while standing. While I was trying to figure out how one could possibly speak on the subject of religion for only 10 minutes, I made a very startling discovery. Tucked away in the files of the Supreme Court's October 1918, forgive me, 1878 term, I found a superseding opinion by Chief Justice Waite, which should have been published but wasn't, in volume 98 of the Supreme Court Reports. Lost to the world until today, I'm now going to read the real opinion in Reynolds against the United States, omitting most citations. <laughs> I do so not only to set the record straight, but also because the lost Reynolds opinion raises the profoundly important question of how far the Bill of Rights can go in protecting individual rights against federal encroachment rooted in the values of society at large. Quote, Mr. Chief Justice Waite delivered the unanimous opinion of the court. The facts of this case set forth at length in the opinion of the Supreme Court of the Territory of Utah are not in dispute. George Reynolds, a devout Mormon, discharged his religious duty by entering into a bigamous marriage. Having thus rendered unto God Reynolds was punished by Caesar. The question for this court is whether Reynolds is constitutionally immune from prosecution and conviction under the federal anti-polygamy statute on the ground of free exercise of religion. To the assertion that historically polygamy has been odious among the northern and western nations of Europe, and until recently, <clears throat> pardon me, until establishment of the Mormon church has been almost exclusively a feature of the life of Asiatic and African people. We have two responses. First, for the most part, the nations of northern and western Europe have hardly been paragons of religious toleration or possessed political systems which protected individual rights. And it is racist to assert that polygamy is not a legitimate religious belief simply because it has heretofore been practiced mainly by Asiatics and Africans. Second, it is the height of presumption to disdain out of hand a practice acknowledged and except for Christianity's rejection of the Old Testament, accepted by every major world religion. Moreover, the highly respected Roman law recognized concubinage, a relationship akin to polygamy and not far removed 
from today's common relationships between married men and their mistresses, between divorced persons and their subsequent spouses, and between men and women, sometimes married and sometimes not, who engage in a multitude of simultaneous sexual relationships, all of which can accurately be characterized as serial polygamy. It is equally presumptuous simply to dismiss the views of such recognized Western thinkers as Plato, Freud, Jung, Nietzsche, Schopenhauer, and even Locke, all of whom, at minimum, saw nothing aberrant in polygamy, and some of whom expressly endorsed the practice. The United States has argued that the Free Exercise Clause protects only belief, not conduct. There are several answers. The historical evidence is not only unsupportive, but it actually cuts the other way. Jefferson, Madison, and others, of course, argued against the persecution of religion and for the protection of religious freedom. They chose to implement their values textually by prohibiting interference with free exercise, and thus necessarily eschewed a belief-conduct dichotomy, a distinction which is prima facie indefensible, especially since conduct, expression, exercise is integral to all major world religions. Carried to its logical extreme, the belief-conduct dichotomy would, in principle, permit the government to outlaw all religious conduct, baptism, sacrament, bar mitzvah, circumcision, perhaps even weddings, thus allowing mere statutes to nullify constitutional command. Paren, C. Marbury v. Madison. Close paren. An amicus curiae brief filed by a fledgling organization purportedly devoted to the protection of civil liberties <laughs> contends that polygamy is analogous to the sacrifice of vestal virgins. A practice illegally gender-based <laughs> and otherwise demeaning to women. The argument is that if the state cannot prevent Mormons from entering into polygamous marriages, it cannot prohibit other religionists from making human sacrifices. Apparently, the civil libertarians fail to realize not only that polygamy among Mormon women is entirely voluntary, but also that no one loses her life. Forced human sacrifice, which the civil libertarians are, of course, correct in opposing, is, of course, an entirely different matter and requires no further discussion. We are convinced by our thorough review of the intent of the framers, by the contextually related material of that period, and by our consideration of the competing policy arguments which illuminate the framers' intent, that the free exercise guarantee of the First Amendment enshrines not some spurious belief conduct or public good order test, but instead the Madisonian standard, to wit, before a religious activity can properly be regulated by the United States, that conduct must be, quote, manifestly injurious, end quote, to legitimate state interests. In other words, since the exercise of one's religious conscience was intended to be and remains an, in, an inalienable, textually explicit individual right, it can be overcome, if at all, only by a government interest which is indeed compelling 
And even then, the means employed by the government will have to be the least restrictive way to accomplish its ends. To the extent that a suggestion has been made that such a compelling state interest exists in the government's duty to protect children, the alleged victims of polygamous marriages, the short answer is that the United States has made no evidentiary showing of that kind, whatever. There is not a shred of evidence that being born to a polygamous marriage, which heretofore has been illegal in the Utah Territory, is harmful at all, or worse than being born illegitimate, which is legal, or having parents who are separated or divorced, which is also legal. Moreover, it can at least be argued that whereas illegitimate children do not know the identity of and frequently lack a relationship with one parent and sometimes both, the offspring of Mormon polygamous marriages know who their parents are. And those children are reared in a pious, loving atmosphere. In this regard, it should also be noted that to the extent data is available, Anthropological studies of polygamous African cultures unambiguously demonstrate that plural wives are neither physically nor otherwise exploited and that they possess a high degree of self-esteem in a tightly knit supportive family setting. To hold that George Reynolds' constitutional right to the free exercise of his religion is no defense to his indictment for violation of the federal anti-polygamy statute would be both illogical and extremely bad policy. Given the legality of what can accurately be characterized as the de facto polygamy described above, i.e. multiple romantic sexual relationships simultaneously and or seriatim, it is indefensible to illegalize the Mormons de jure polygamy which flows not from convenience, whim, pleasure seeking, or liberation, but from profound religious belief and obligation, important values sought to be protected by the free exercise clause of the First Amendment. The conviction of George Reynolds is reversed and the indictment is dismissed. Wait, there's another brief opinion. And uh, I thank uh, Professor McConnell for his offer to introduce me to Rocky. We have already met. The uh, further brief opinion is entitled, Mr. Justice Holzer Concurring. <laughs> While I join in the opinion of the court, with whose express views I am in complete agreement, I am nevertheless obliged to identify what I perceive to be the court's unarticulated major premise, one which certain members of this court and of courts yet to come will necessarily have to deal with explicitly. As I read the court's opinion, it holds that the value of the First Amendment's free exercise of religion clause is so integral to our democratic republic that the uncommon and even frowned upon Mormon religious practice of polygamy is entitled to constitutional protection against the legislative power of Congress and the executive power of the president. But at root, what is that value? And to where does it consi its consistent application lead? It seems to me that no matter what the analytical entry point and no matter how much the court's discussion focuses on the free exercise of religion, the foundation of today's decision is laid in the bedrock of what might aptly be called personal autonomy. In the principle that members of a free society may engage in any apparently constitutionally protected conduct they wish until their actions collide with government's responsibility of assuring that the rights of others are not violated. If this be the principle for which the instant case speaks, it would appear that henceforth all federal legislation trenching on areas of personal autonomy, e.g. laws dealing with conscription, drug use, pornography, and a fortiori federal statutes affecting 
mere property, will have to pass Bill of Rights muster, including measurement against the catch-all Ninth Amendment, which recognizes the existence of and purports to protect a potentially vast category of unenumerated individual rights. Needless to say, contentions of that sort made to and within this court will eventually cause a profound schism between those who believe that government possesses the collectivist statist power to control individual action for the perceived common good, even absent manifest physical harm to others, and those who believe that physical harm to others is the sole criteria for the exercise of federal power restraining individual action. It will be an interesting and crucial debate. I wonder who will win. Thank you. but I don't feel completely isolated uh, <laughs> uh, after that correct opinion in Reynolds against the United States. Uh, I, as you all know, I'm a last minute substitution for Mort Halpern who couldn't be here. I think he suggested me uh, because he remembered that I had given a provocative talk on the religion issues to the ACLU convention last summer. What didn't occur to him, I think, was how different the audiences were. I don't think, I don't think it's likely that I'm going to provoke hissing here uh, if I suggest that Bob Jones may have been wrongly decided uh, or that tuition tax credits and equal access may be constitutional uh, or that a religious school may have a First Amendment right not to grant official recognition to a gay student group on its campus. Um, and so my problem is, how do I uh, provoke you? <laughs> Uh, uh, I, will, I will make some attempt at least to do that, and I should emphasize that I'm speaking for myself. Uh, like tenured professors nearing retirement, ACLU lawyers do have some uh, uh, protection for freedom of speech uh, against infringement not only by the government but by their employers. Um, uh, I don't know a lot about the Federalist Society, but there appear to be uh, two, at least two uh, important threads in, in uh, some of the beliefs that I gather you all share, uh, one being libertarianism and another, though, being, uh, uh, to speak loosely, states' rights. Uh, yet those are not at all uh, wholly consistent uh, points of view, and, and certainly in the religious area, as in others, uh, they're not always going to be congruous. Uh, while the federal government may have more potential for uh, oppression of individual rights uh, on a large scale. Uh, states can certainly do their share, and American history uh, certainly teaches us that, that states have done their share. Uh, transferring powers from the courts to the legislature or the federal government to the states uh, is certainly not the, the surest way of uh, fostering individual liberty. Um, I, was, I was told that I might well provoke you uh, if I said that I thought the First Amendment uh, was properly applicable to the states. Uh, but I certainly do think that, and I think that's particularly true uh, in 1986. Uh, I think that the, the intentions of the founders uh, are, are obviously, uh, to me, a, a crucial uh, perspective to look at when interpreting the Constitution. Um, uh, but I think it is fair also to look at the society that we live in today. Uh, and, and at the society that we, that we uh, passed through on the way here. Uh, one thing that, that doesn't often enough seem to get mentioned in, in talking about uh, the original intent and, and uh, uh, interpreting the Constitution uh, is one of the crucial constitutional events of our history uh, which didn't occur in the courts and, and didn't even occur in the amending process in Congress, but occurred on the ground, and that's the Civil War. Uh, not only are there the Civil War amendments, of course, but there's also the Civil War itself, and probably the single most flagrant unconstitutional act in American history. Uh, I suspect that the founders uh, in 1781 uh, would have likely said that the states had joined this compact voluntarily and could withdraw. Uh, but but that, that opinion was overruled at Appomattox. Uh, and I think we have to uh, live, we, I think it's 
if I thought this was bad, I might think differently, but, but I think it's good, and so it's easy for me to say, I think we have to live with that result, and should live with that result. Uh, we are now, and have been for 100 years, uh, one society. Um, uh, I have, uh, I, I make no claim to have my antenna uh, tuned to the, to the uh, uh, common feelings of the American people across the country. I live in, inside the Beltway, as they say, uh, and, and talk a lot with people who work for the ACLU. But we get a lot of phone calls in the office all the time, and, and what has always struck me as remarkable is what the people who call the ACLU uh, think when we tell them uh, that their legal rights are different because they're in Maryland or Virginia, uh, or that uh, it does not violate their freedom of speech or freedom of religion because their private employer uh, has just fired them because they insisted on taking off a religious holiday or uh, uh, writing a letter to the editor of the paper that the employer didn't like. Uh, they find that very hard to understand. I, I don't think the law uh, necessarily needs to, to uh, conform to, to their uh, somewhat unthinking expectations, but, uh, uh, but I think we ought to realize that we're in a country where uh, something like half the population moves every three years. Not all across state lines, but frequently they do. Uh, people jet across the country just to speak for 10 minutes at a symposium. Uh, you, you check into the Stanford Park Hotel and they ask you, do you want a, a West Coast newspaper or an East Coast newspaper with breakfast in the morning? Th this is uh, a, a single country, uh, and at least when it comes to, to some very uh, basic principles uh, that most people uh, today think of as, as uh, uh, national principles, we, we uh, ought to be too quick to, to, uh, uh, to say that, that uh, a given state can completely ignore them. Um, let me move on to some more particular uh, thoughts about some of the cases that have been mentioned this morning and, and, uh, and some of the principles that are involved. And I, I apologize for not having a more set piece uh, presentation. Um, uh, I was asked to come Monday evening, Tuesday, the President's Commission on Organized Crime recommended that we all be required to submit to urine testing for drugs, and that was a busy day. And, uh, <laughs> On Wednesday, the National Park Service released its uh, new final regulations, uh, severely restricting the uh, rights of demonstrators in Lafayette Park across from the White House. Uh, no question about, about the First Amendment's application there, but some question about what it says. Um, and that was a busy day, too. Um, but turning back to the, to the Establishment Clause, um, uh, school prayer is certainly one of the issues on which I suspect I'm divided. For many of you, it seems to me that there's, there's an important element about uh, public school prayer that, that ought to be more firmly uh, in, in all of our minds, and that is that we're talking about a public school where attendance is compulsory. Uh, talking about uh, allowing people uh, their freedom, uh, that is the majority of the people uh, in a particular school or a particular class or school district to exercise their individual choice uh, in a context where everybody is there uh, to a certain extent against their will in the first place uh, is leaving out an essential element of the situation. Yes, it's true a person has the right to go to a private school. Um, uh, many people can't afford to go to private school. In many cases, private schools are not available in a particular locality. Uh, the law doesn't, uh, except for Amish over 16 years old, uh, allow you to stay home. Uh, from public school, and so you are put there willy-nilly, uh, and, and to say then, uh, well, the majority of your fellow students or, or teachers or the principal uh, ought to be able to exercise their freedom uh, uh, to engage in uh, organized group prayer uh, seems to me uh, a little bit to, to, to look uh, backwards at the, at the actual situation in the school. Um, uh, I don't feel the same way uh, about a, a, a true moment of silence, not an Alabama-style moment of silence, but, but uh, a moment of silence that, that does not uh, uh, carry uh, with it unstated, uh, perhaps unstated by the teacher, certainly stated by the state legislature, the, uh, the suggestion of what you to do at that moment of silence. Um, uh, the ACLU uh, finds a, a case like Bender a more difficult one, the, the, the equal access case currently on the Supreme Court's docket. Uh, 
Uh, and, and I think it might be interesting for a moment or two to, to talk about why the ACLU internally is somewhat split on that case, because it's an interesting split. Uh, it's a split that, that largely can be explained geographically. Uh, uh, people from the East Coast and the West Coast, uh, and to a certain extent from Chicago, uh, think, well, maybe I shouldn't say how we think the court should vote, but think that the principle of equal access is, a, is an acceptable and even good principle. I think it's a good principle. Um, but people from Alabama, Mississippi, Oklahoma, Wyoming, uh, most of the, the, the mountain states and the Bible Belt uh, feel just the opposite. And when you, when you talk to them, uh, it turns out that, that they are not uh, reading the Federalist Papers differently uh, from others of us. And they're not, they're not uh, uh, differing on, on matters of uh, constitutional historical scholarship there looking at the world that surrounds them. Uh, they're looking at schools. I remember one uh, network newscast on this issue a couple of years ago uh, interviewed a teacher in a, in a school somewhere in the, the southwest part of the country who said, uh, I'm a Christian. I believe that means that Christianity has to pervade my life, including uh, the public school class I teach. Uh, and, and of course, uh, I uh, indoctrinate all my students in in that Christianity. If I didn't, that would be violating my religious beliefs. Uh, that's the atmosphere that a lot of people remember growing up in and, and know that they're sending their children to schools in today. And when you say, uh, when I say to the, to the director of the ACLU of Oklahoma, don't you think it's fair that all groups have equal access to the, to the auditorium or the meeting rooms at uh, 4 p.m.? She says, you know, in my town there's going to be a meeting every week of the, of the Baptist group. Uh, and no other group uh, can or will meet in that school, and, and the meetings will be uh, uh, encouraged by teachers and parents and principals, and uh, non-participation will be looked at askance, and that's just the way life is where I come from. Now, I grew up in New York City. I went to a public high school that had uh, probably a dozen religions uh, represented, uh, and, and uh, free First Amendment practice uh, to an extent that uh, uh, most high school principals would find unthinkable. Uh, and so I don't react that way, but, but I, think, I think that uh, when we get outside of uh, law schools and, and auditoriums, we have to realize that the First Amendment, uh, like the rest of the Constitution, really does affect how people live. Uh, moving for a moment to the free exercise clause, um, I, I, I think, and I suspect I agree with many of you here, that, that the courts and the ACLU uh, have been too statist on those issues, too quick to find a compelling interest. Uh, I don't understand uh, why uh, poor Mr. Reynolds wasn't allowed to have two wives. Uh, I also don't understand uh, why poor Ms. Prince, the uh, 12 or 14 year old girl in Massachusetts, uh, four years ago, wasn't allowed to uh, sell uh, Jehovah's Witness tracts on the corner with her parents uh, in violation of the Massachusetts child labor laws. Um, uh, and the court found a compelling interest there. I don't understand why uh, the uh, Amish had to participate in the social security system. Um, but if you accept those kinds of propositions, uh, then I think there are some others that, that you have to accept too to follow the principle through. Um, uh, if, there, if there was a compelling interest in, in enforcing the child labor laws and uh, the social security law, then it's not hard to understand why there's a compelling interest in the Dayton Christian Schools case. Uh, at, least, at least as to the second part. The, the first part of that case is whether the school can, can enforce a policy against employing mothers of young children who they believe uh, belong home with the children. Um, I find myself very sympathetic to that. But the second part uh, is that they can fire a teacher because she had the temerity to complain to the EEOC about what she believed was, was uh, a violation of the, of the anti-discrimination laws to her detriment. Um, if there's any interest that, that it seems to me almost by definition has to be considered compelling by the government, it is the interest in allowing people uh, uh, to go to the courts to enforce the, the laws. Um, uh, if, if the government doesn't have a compelling interest in, in the abstract enforcement of its own law, uh, then you've designed a self-destructing system. Um, uh, similarly, it seems to me, if you, if you 
honor the free exercise claim in cases like Reynolds and Prince and Lee and Bob Jones, then uh, you need to react uh, more thoughtfully and, and uh, uh, more sympathetically uh, to the claim of someone like Timothy Leary, that he has a religious right to use his LSD, uh, or to the claims of the Rastafarians, which have been, I think, thrown out of every court where they've been raised, uh, that they have a religious obligation to use marijuana privately, uh, harming no one but themselves, presumably, if, if, if it's harm at all. Uh, and yet the courts, uh, conservative judges, as quickly as liberal judges, uh, have found compelling state interests there. Um, finally, uh, let me speak for a moment on one of last term's cases that, that was mentioned earlier that I think is, is, a, is a most interesting one, and that's uh, State of Thornton against Caldors, um, because it, it raises an issue that, that is really endemic, not just to, to religious issues, but to First Amendment issues generally, uh, and that is uh, how do you resolve the dilemma that it is only by increasing the power of the state uh, uh, that you can protect individual rights against infringement by, by people other than the state. Um, uh, most people, although, although the state sector now is, is enormously greater than it was 200 years ago, most people uh, aren't government employees still, and, and, and the power of individual uh, organizations in the private sector is also enormously greater than it was 200 years ago. You, you didn't have, uh, at the time of the Constitution, multinational corporations and corporations employing millions of people uh, uh, the way you do today. Uh, you had much more uh, individual freedom in the sense that people were in control of their own lives uh, altogether. Um, and so in Connecticut, you have a, a good example of a, of a state law that says to a private employer, thou shalt respect the religious uh, activities of, of thine employees. Um, uh, there's, there's uh, no easy way out. Either you uh, use the iron hand of the state to crack down upon this private employer uh, and tell him how he must run his employment practices, um, uh, or the private employer has the ability uh, to, to uh, infringe on the individual freedom of his employees. Uh, in this particular case, the facts weren't too bad. The, the guy was offered a transfer to another store or uh, was, was uh, told that he'd be allowed to take Sundays off if he accepted the motion from manager to salesman. But, but there are certainly plenty of other cases where the employer's conduct is, is uh, uh, much worse. Um, uh, what's the proper role of the government in a case like that? Do we want to maximize individual freedom uh, uh, by uh, giving the government uh, the power to enforce anti-discrimination laws, uh, laws that would protect free speech in the private sector, uh, uh, laws that would protect freedom of religion in the private sector, or is the danger greater, the danger to individual liberty ultimately greater, by giving the government those very powers uh, with which it will uh, uh, oppress the Dayton Christian schools uh, and, and uh, uh, the private universities and the private employers. I don't have a particularly good answer to that, and I'm sure there isn't one that's good for all times and all purposes, but I think that's one area where, where uh, right today, we're confronting the, the, uh, the edge of civil liberties and constitutional law. Thanks. Professor Coy. Before I came to Stanford, back in Boston, Massachusetts, I thought somebody might raise the modest question that was raised last night. Uh, why do we need government at all? And uh, thought about it, and I came to the conclusion that we need government uh, to make some kind of order out of chaos. But having traveled to Stanford from the San Francisco airport, my major point was taken away from me. <laughs> I'm sitting here and I'm going to use 17 minutes, Mr. Burley. We negotiated over the phone. Can you imagine I negotiated for an extra 60 seconds and he wouldn't give it to me? <laughs> this year, uh, we have cause to celebrate 
the bicentennial of Thomas Jefferson's immortal Virginia Bill for establishing religious freedom. Like Jefferson's bill and Madison's memorial and remonstrance written a year earlier, the First Amendment's clause prohibiting a religious establishment was added to our Constitution, I believe, to foreclose the preferential treatment of any one church, religious sect, or religious tradition. This no preference doctrine was the fundamental principle reflected in disestablishment, not only of Virginia's Episcopal Church in 1786, but also of established churches in New York, Maryland, and North Carolina during the preceding decade. The no preference doctrine is also evident in the Constitution's Article 6, where the framers prohibited any religious test or qualification for holding public office. But concern about preferential treatment for a particular church, religious sect, or tradition was not to end there. The Virginia, Maryland, North Carolina, and Rhode Island state ratifying conventions proposed amendments to the new Constitution that were intended to protect the individual's religious liberty and apply the no preference doctrine to the national government. Typical of these proposed amendments was the one passed by the New York State Ratifying Convention. And I quote, that the people have an equal, natural, and unalienable right freely and peaceably to exercise their religion according to the dictates of conscience, and that no religious sect or society ought to be favored or established by law in preference to others, unquote. In the first House of Representatives, Congressman James Madison proposed what ultimately became the religion clauses of the First Amendment. Even after Madison's draft was changed by Congressional Committee deliberations, when asked in debate on the House floor what the reworded clause meant, Madison said he, quote, apprehended the meaning of the words to be that Congress should not establish a religion and enforce the legal observation of it by law, unquote. Taken together, these actions and others during the formative years of our federal republic indicate that regarding religion, the First Amendment was intended to prevent the establishment of a national church or religion or the placing of any one religious sect, religious tradition, or religious denomination into a preferred legal status, a status which had to the framers of our Constitution always characterized religious establishments. But much has changed since then. For almost four decades now, this nation has had, for the most part, to endure the poor scholarship and the untenable historical analysis with which the United States Supreme Court has sought to justify its reading of the First Amendment injunction, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. From the first establishment clause case, Everson and the Board of Education decided in 1947, to this very moment, a nobly broad interpretation of church-state separation has, for the most part, been employed by the courts of the land, but perhaps not too much longer. For the first time since the Establishment Clause was initially interpreted in Everson, a member of the United States Supreme Court, Mr. Justice Rehnquist, has embraced the no-preference doctrine and has consequently challenged the central doctrinal assumption of all of the court's church-state cases. That fundamental assumption enunciated in Everson is that the authors of the Establishment Clause and the First Amendment intended thereby to create a high and impregnable wall of separation 
between church and state, a wall which would preclude any government activity that aided one religion, aided all religions, or preferred one religion over another. With appeals to the carefully chosen actions of Jefferson, Madison, and events in the Virginia legislature of 1785 and 1786, all of the opinions in Everson sought to bolster the court's high and impregnable wall dictum. Omitted from all of the Everson opinions and most subsequent Supreme Court Establishment Clause cases are any historical facts that run counter to this interpretation. Let there be no mistake about it. The framers of the First Amendment believed in separation of church and state. So much so that I believe it would generally go undisputed, even on this panel, that the major political contribution of the constitutional system which they fashioned is this very concept of church-state separation. However, no matter what the Supreme Court and eminent scholars have written to the contrary, a careful scrutiny of the relevant words and actions of those who are chiefly responsible for adding the First Amendment to the Constitution, together with the actions of our early presidents and Congresses, including Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, show clearly that they embraced a far narrower concept of church-state separation than that proclaimed by the United States Supreme Court in the Everson case and since. For just a few moments, if you will, Brian, permit me to contrast the court's misguided high and impregnable wall with some American historical fact. Item, attributing to Jefferson and Madison an absolute separationist view, the court references Jefferson's Virginia bill for establishing religious freedom. Madison introduced this bill in 1785 in the Virginia legislature or assembly as Jefferson's surrogate and it did become law in 1786. But the Everson court neglected to tell us that on that very same day, Madison introduced another bill equally attributed to Jefferson, which severely fined Sabbath breakers. This too became law in 1786. Do these two Madison Jefferson acts taken together represent a high and impregnable wall of separation between church and state? Item, after a 37 to 14 vote, to recommend what is now the First Amendment to the states for ratification. The debates in Congress show that the first House of Representatives on the very next day proposed a resolution asking President George Washington to issue a Thanksgiving Day proclamation. James Madison, then a member of the House, did not object to the resolution. Others did object, Madison did not. Instead, as president, Madison issued four Thanksgiving Day proclamations asking the nation to set aside, quote, a day of public humiliation and prayer, unquote. High and impregnable item, unaware that in 1981, the chaplaincies in both the Senate and House of Representatives would be challenged in federal court as violating the amendment which they wrote, the members of the first Congress established the congressional chaplain system. James Madison was one of six members of the joint congressional committee that recommended the system. The committee's proposal was accepted by both houses of Congress and an annual salary of $500 from federal monies was paid for public prayers in Congress. Does this act, which shows conclusively that the authors of the First Amendment saw no necessary incongruity between it and federally funded religious activities attest to a high and impregnable wall? Item, in 1803, after he wrote his Danbury Baptist letter which contained the wall of separation metaphor, 
As president, Thomas Jefferson requested the United States Senate to ratify a proposed treaty with the Kaskaskia Indians, which included a clause pledging the United States to build a Roman Catholic church and to provide a yearly stipend for its priest. After the treaty was ratified, Jefferson asked Congress to act in its legislative capacity to meet the treaty obligations. When Congress appropriated the U.S. tax dollars to build that Roman Catholic Church at Jefferson's request, did it pass a law respecting the establishment of religion? Item, beginning in 1796 and culminating in 1804, the Congress of the United States passed laws which in effect paid with enormous land grants in controlling trusts an evangelical Christian sect to spread and maintain the gospel among Indians in the Ohio Territory. One of these laws was signed by George Washington. Two were signed by John Adams. And three were signed by the third president of the United States. In 1802, 1803, and 1804, Thomas Jefferson signed into law congressional enactments providing land for the, quote, Society for the United Brethren for propagating the gospel among the heathen, unquote. Is this a high and impregnable wall of separation between church and state? Of course not. All of these historical actions are irreconcilable with the court's high and impregnable wall theory. All are compatible with the no preference interpretation of church-state separation. Let the advocates of the court's position answer why the framers of the Constitution and the First Amendment would subscribe to a high and impregnable wall of church-state separation and then proceed to flagrantly violate it. After weighing all of the evidence in my book, Separation of Church and State, or my article in the winter 1986 edition of the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy on the No Preference Doctrine, I believe you may and probably will conclude that at least for the framers of the First Amendment, they sought to constitutionally guarantee that no single national religion would be imposed by the federal government, nor would any one religion, religious sect, or religious tradition be placed in a legally preferred position. For them, separation of church and state precluded state religious partisanship, not state religious accommodation. It is not surprising then that non-preferential or non-discriminatory use of religious institutions by government was not considered a violation of the First Amendment or the Establishment Clause until declared so by the middle of this century by the United States Supreme Court. Important as it may be, what is involved here is much more than the proper relationship between church and state. What is also at issue here is the integrity of the Supreme Court itself. If the court continues to use an historical analysis to determine its establishment clause law, let the court now begin by embracing a more responsible historical appeal, not easily faulted by existing primary documentation. Failure to do that only invites scorn for the court and makes it appear a partisan, which undermines its essential role as referee of a complex political and constitutional system. Finally, should the Supreme Court now reverse itself and adopt the narrower interpretation of church-state separation, which the framers of our Constitution embraced, I do not think we need rationally fear the emergence of some religious inquisition. A moment of silent contemplation in a public schoolroom 
even in Alabama, or a public school teacher aiding a dyslexic student in a parochial school is hardly an immediate prelude to the reintroduction of the screw in the rack. And I do believe that a mind is a terrible thing to waste, even if it's the mind of a dyslexic parochial school student. I started by saying we celebrate today Jefferson's immortal bill for religious liberty. Had there been an activist Supreme Court in Virginia, that bill probably would not have been written. And Madison, probably the year earlier, would never have written his immortal memorial and remonstrance against religious assessments. The important point is that the American tradition of separation of church and state was not born of judicial power. It was forged in the heat of the political process. It took a decade, but it was forged in the heat of the political process. Its sustenance now, as in Jefferson's time, ultimately depends on the commitment of a free, tolerant, wise, and sensitive people. Let none here today think that a religiously tolerant society, which like ours is extremely diverse, calls for restraint only from those who choose to believe. Religious tolerance in a pluralistic society requires also the restraint and understanding of those who continue to question as well as those who choose not to believe. For at bottom, ladies and gentlemen, the simple fact is that in a democratic constitutional state, no court, however powerful or good its intentions, can save the people from themselves. Thank you very much, members of the panel. I think the, uh, every member of the panel has had his uh, 16 or 17 minutes, and uh, consequently we should go on relatively soon to uh, questions from the audience, uh, giving the panel a chance to respond to each other if they like in the course of uh, answering the audience. But I have been encouraged by the organizers of this affair to step out a little bit from the role of moderator uh, to say a few words uh, of my own on the subject, and that will, in a sense, close the panel, and then we'll open it up to uh, the audience. It seemed to me that I was a, a poor prophet uh, in predicting a three-to-one ratio. I thought that the first uh, speaker, Professor McConnell, gave us an admirably impartial uh, rundown of the various options. I thought our second speaker was uh, essentially in the uh, ACLU camp, although not with all factions of the ACLU. And of course, we then heard from uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Spitzer with, I thought, uh, very interesting uh, practical uh, insights on ACLU thinking and divisions. And finally, we had what I would consider a, an admirably impartial and irrefutable uh, presentation of historical uh, evidence. If there was controversy over Professor Cord, it's controversy over what you do with it, uh, not with the, over the, the facts that he presents. And I feel, in general, that uh, none of the speakers addressed what seemed to me the uh, Central question is, uh, can government be neutral in questions of religion? Uh, if it cannot be neutral, uh, you have very serious problems in uh, enforcing an ideal of neutrality. You're compelled to engage in hypocrisy. Uh, 
And I believe that on all sides, a great deal of hypocrisy um, is engaged in. Uh, to challenge Professor Holzer on one example where I think the libertarians are not quite as candid as they might be, I don't know a single society, a single government that has ever uh, recognized the full range of r religious liberty, full exercise. No society in the history of the world has done so. Uh, in the face of that historical record, I think one is driven to ask, could a society give a full reign to religious liberty on the two central questions that make governments work? Could you have full liberty of conscience as to paying taxes, and could you have full liberty of conscience as to not serving in the armed forces? Could you really recognize the free exercise of religion in these essential attributes of government? We've never tried it. We shouldn't pretend that we have. Certainly Madison and Jefferson uh, never got close to it at all. I thought that Professor Holtz's opinion, the main opinion by Chief Justice Waite, was a brilliant examination of what demonstration of what it would be if you emptied constitutional law of the religious traditions of our people. It may be the state we are now in, but it struck me as an extraordinarily logical and ahistorical demonstration of where we were if we didn't have a past rooted in a Bible that is both Jewish and Christian. The historical uh, data that Professor Cord uh, presents uh, could be supplemented by one or two other quotations which I think are relevant. Uh, John Adams, when he was approached by the Baptists in Massachusetts asking for religious liberty to be free of paying taxes to support the established church in Massachusetts, uh, told Isaac Backus, you might as well expect us to give up our tax system, our establishment, as for the solar system to change. That was the point of view of one of the founding fathers. And James Madison, who was so often uh, co-opted by rationalists, presented as some kind of deist, in one of the key letters he wrote, not so long before he helped form the Virginia Declaration of Rights. He was writing, uh, William Bradford, later to be Attorney General of the United States. They were both young graduates of Princeton. And Madison expressed the hope that whatever they did, whatever he and Bradford did, they would be fervent advocates in the cause of Christ. That's a very different point of view than the uh, rationalist uh, image of Madison that is part of the myth. Now I think that uh, what we've seen this morning is, is candid facing of the facts. I think that we could improve the situation even further if we recognize that there is a serious problem about government being neutral. That in fact our tradition was rooted in a biblical religion which we may have gone past but that is still a question uh, to be debated and that it would be an immense uh, advance in uh, ecumenical understanding between liberals and conservatives if the liberals would concede Professor Cord's facts, no longer try to bolster their position with invocations of Madison and Jefferson and say, well, the Civil War changed all that or the 14th Amendment changed all that or Everson changed all that, but not engage in the old myths. Well, with that uh, plea, let me open the uh, proceeding to questions. Yes.
Mr. Spitzer, you uh, spoke for First Amendment Incorporation and were provocative. <laughs> uh, you, you said we're a national country, people move all around the country all the time, and therefore we should have national standards. And yet you also said, which I found to be a somewhat of a contradiction, that the, uh, the Rocky Mountain and the Bible Belt states oppose equal access. So apparently there are some substantial uh, local differences which still exist. Now, no doubt you're aware that every state constitution provides uh, for religious freedom guarantees in the Constitution, and most state courts have interpreted those guarantees, and many of them in a very liberal way, even more liberal than, than, than federal First Amendment interpretation. So let me ask you, if, if the minority of, of a state, which, which if, if say the state court or the state legislature supported, supported school prayer, and a minority of the people disagreed with, with that and couldn't get their way in that state, well then why couldn't they exercise uh, their right to move, as you, you said, one third of the people move anyway, and move to states of like-minded people, such as Rhode Island or Alaska, and no doubt somewhere they would dominate the state and, and, and have their way, and therefore we, don't, we wouldn't really need uh, in First Amendment incorporation. Well, the answer is yes, that's, that's a possible scenario. Uh, let me give you a, what I think may be a comparable scenario, and that is what if uh, some state decides to expropriate all private property um, uh, without uh, just compensation, uh, the Fifth Amendment doesn't apply, and we say, you know, People who live in that state who didn't like that idea, tough. Uh, if you can hide your, your uh, diamonds in your shoes and get out to another state, you know, good luck. Uh, and, and if you can't, you're caught. Um, uh, I think that uh, many people, including a lot here even, uh, might think that was not such a dandy idea. Uh, and and uh, there's no uh, one answer that comes down either from uh, Jefferson or from heaven, but uh, I think uh, we are one country in 1986. People assume, that the vast majority of people, except for constitutional historians, assume that when it comes to, to some bedrock <laughs> principles of, of individual freedom, of, of uh, how society is organized, of, of what's fair, uh, we ought to have, with certainly room for variation, but we ought to have a, a national answer to those questions. Just, just one modification. I don't really think any state would actually expropriate complete private property, unless it was a state I was talking about, where all the ACLU types moved to. I, uh, I'd like to follow up on that, if I may, because there's an assumption in what uh, author has said that needs to be ventilated. Uh, I think we need a clear articulation of why, and on what basis, and by what power. Uh, folks who uh, believe, as the author does, think they have the power to jettison the most fundamental bedrock principle of American constitutionalism, which is federalism. Just because a whole bunch of people, uh, mostly liberals, think that we need, quote, national solutions to things. All right, Mr. Nuswa. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Spitzer, the ACLU recently argued and won a Tenth Circuit case against Bernalillo County, Bernalillo County in uh, New Mexico. Bernalillo County uh, and all of that part of New Mexico was uh, uh, founded and developed by the Spanish Roman Catholic influence of conquistadores and Spanish friars that had come through the area. Bernalillo County's constitutional violation was to place on its county symbol uh, a sign of the friars holding the cross and the words con este vencemos uh, in allusion to its historical past. My question is, is not the agenda in, in, of the ACLU uh, what Professor, or what Pastor Newhouse has argued uh, to preserve the naked public square and perhaps what Judge Noonan is alluding to, to deny the religious contributions uh, that have been in, integrally, integrally involved in the founding of this country? Well, I, I, don't, I don't think that's the mission of the ACLU, and even I don't think it should be the mission of the ACLU. Um, but let me uh, state a few other facts in, in the particular case uh, from Bernalillo County. The, the county uh, seal, which is Albuquerque and, and surrounding area, contains a, a cross uh, with rays, a blaze of light rays coming out of it. And, and the slogan, as I understand the translation, is something like, with this we conquer. Uh, and, and police officers wear it on a patch on their shoulder, and police cars have it on the door. Uh, uh, this cross and the slogan that says, with this we conquer. And, and uh, 
many people in Albuquerque and the area around Albuquerque, uh, uh, Indian tribes who live there who are not Christians, uh, Jews and others, uh, I can very well understand how they find it uh, uh, much more offensive uh, than just uh, uh, the incidental religious historical symbols that we sometimes see in other contexts. Uh, it's a powerful message that's being transmitted on a police uniform or a police car and with this we conquer the cross. Now that may be the history, um, uh, and maybe for historical reasons the court, and the Supreme Court may well say, if, if, uh, if cert is granted, uh, you know, leave it alone, like, like the Nebraska legislative prayer a couple of years ago. But, but I don't think it's outrageous for people to say uh, that their government, of which they are equal citizens and which they equally support with their taxes and their loyalty, uh, shouldn't be flaunting that kind of a, of a, a divisive symbol. Uh, to them. Just one follow-up question. Uh, the offense taken by certain citizens, and, and maybe I should point out too, the, the patch and the county symbol would also appear on the county trash trucks, and, and, and the symbol does not mean they're trying to conquer on behalf of Christ when they're well, collecting trash in the streets of Albuquerque, but uh, I, I'm, I'm wondering what offense, the fact that certain citizens would take offense to any of our symbols, including the In God We Trust slogan on our coins, has to do with constitutional principles. Well, I, I think that better be your question then, because I think there are so many let me, people. Let me respond once more briefly, and that is uh, what you say is not without some force, but it's interesting to see how people react differently when the shoe is on the other foot. Uh, when the citizens of Antelope, uh, uh, Washington or Oregon, uh, all of a sudden found themselves citizens of Rajnishtan, uh, uh, they were not so uh, happy all of a sudden about uh, uh, religious, the majority's religious uh, values being imposed upon them. And I think we ought to at least be consistent. But also, oh, 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 I think we better give the, uh, go, go ahead. Thanks, I wonder if uh, Professor Cord would expand a bit on the role of uh, non-believers, atheists and agnostics in the, in the non-preferentialist mode in, when you say religious tradition, you always qualified no church, no religious tradition. If you accept uh, a lot of the argument made constantly today by evangelicals about secular humanism being a religion, doesn't it follow then that if, if you're going to be non-preferentialist, you've got to be non-preferentialist with an eye towards this, quote, religion that is atheism or agnosticism? Well, I think, uh, I think that's a very good question. And uh, it gets me squarely into original intent, uh, which I hope you haven't had enough of. Uh, I believe that there are prospective principles in the Constitution that are relevant today. And under um, and <clears throat> the Establishment Clause principle, as I say, is non-preferential treatment. Now, one, uh, I'm not suggesting that we don't decide an Everson case because there weren't buses in uh, 1791. But I do think we can take principles out of the past, principles that make sense to us when we look at the actions and the words of the framers and apply them. Now, the question you've raised, I haven't addressed yet. I addressed it partially in my book, and I address it in a rather large footnote on the no preference doctrine. Um, I guess under the classifications that are enunciated by Professor McConnell, I'm a, a pluralist. Now, there's an extensive a footnote here, and let me just say very simply that I agree with the United States Supreme Court in U.S. versus Seeger that there may be people who have a philosophy which in their life has the same kind of moving force or commitment than someone who is a religionist of a more standard religion. Keeping in mind in Cantwell versus Connecticut uh, that freedom to believe uh, the court says is absolute but the freedom to exercise is not the Congress has made available an alternative in legislation for conscientious objection. If Seeger indeed has a religious position, whether he calls it atheism or what have you, 
Uh, that, to me, falls under the no preference principle. All right. Now, if you, that doesn't mean that I believe all non-theistic positions are theistic ones. And uh, I suppose we're going to leave it to the legal profession to find the intricate tools uh, to make determinations, even as the IRS and many other bureaus make determinations on what constitutes a valid religious deduction as opposed to what is not a valid religious deduction. I have a friend of mine in the philosophy department who got a doctorate of divinity uh, through the mail and then proceeded to not pay his income tax. Well, that came to an end. Um, and even in a democratic administration, Mr. Cooper. Um, so I would take the position that if one is really committed to a particular uh, set of beliefs that has in their life the same status as a religious belief, the no preference doctrine protects them as well. Can I just follow I, up? I'm sorry, uh, we're running out of time. We, uh, our time was up at 10.30. Now we started, we got into the panel 15 minutes late, so we've, we've taken that 15 minutes. I'm told that by the organizers that we have time for one more question and one more very brief response. I, I apologize to the people that have lined up, but I think you're the next person, and then we can't throw the rest of the day off, so I'm, I'm sorry, but why don't you ask your question? Thank you. Uh, my question is addressed to Professor Cord and Professor Holzer. And uh, it's a question which uh, the court has not yet addressed, but which it may very well have to address in the near future. And the question is this, what happens when there is a clash between the free speech and the establishment clauses of the First Amendment, whereby upholding one of those clauses creates a violation of the other? For example, if the court were, were to hold that the display of a lone un, unattended nativity scene on public property were to create a establishment clause violation, but that denying uh, access to uh, pu this public property uh, for a private organization creates a free speech clause violation, what's the court to do? Uh, in Bender, the Third Circuit held that we're supposed to balance the interests involved and to uh, determine whether there's a big or a little establishment clause violation? Does one clause trump the other, or does this balancing approach uh, create any rational? Well, I, I wonder if you could give a fairly succinct uh, response, because uh, <laughs> to that. Uh, you want me to break with the traditions uh -huh. of a lifetime. Uh -huh. uh, I would say that the way the non-preference doctrine it, it makes more reconcilable and the freedom of religious exercise and the Establishment Clause. For instance, um, let's take equal access in the Bender case. I mean, speech, press, assembly, and free exercise, why should that bow to the Establishment Clause? If the original intent, no preference doctrine is applied, anybody of any religion can get a room. And there is no problem between free exercise, and the Establishment Clause. I don't think the framers wanted to build a contradiction into the First Amendment, and I, that leads me even to believe that the No Preference Doctrine even has more credibility beyond historical evidence. The short answer for me is that if the concept of rights generally and constitutional rights in particular are properly understood, there won't be a conflict in that or in any other situation. There's no such thing as a conflict of rights. There can't be if they're properly understood. Well, thank you, and uh, we'll have a brief adjournment.